My name is Ken Hers. I am the president of Nebraska Cattlemen. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. As uh, Bonita said, this is the last of a four-part series, uh, four webinars we've had titled The Black Swan Events. What we have been doing is taking a close, closer look at uh, the markets and uh, trying to get some understanding of what's going on in all, all segments of the market. If you miss any of these webinars, you can find them on the Nebraska Academy website. Uh, I encourage you to go back there. These have been very popular. And I think the last webinar we're gonna have is gonna be our best webinar. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley Coles, who's on staff in Nebraska Cattlemen, and she will be moderating tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, and thank you to everybody who's joining us again, uh, some of you for the first time, but also some of you for the fourth time. And for me, it is an honor to introduce I'm sorry, I totally got disconnected there. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so Kate Miller, she is known online as the Meat Lady. Uh, she is a third generation cow calf producer from Southern Arkansas. And she has 10 years of domestic and international meat sales experience working with Cisco, US Foods, and other broadline distributors and retailers. Uh, she tries to bring the meat industry experience back home to her family ranch uh, to tell the story of the beef industry from the trailer to the table. Uh, for those of you who don't follow Kate on Facebook and Twitter, I highly recommend you check out her honest commentary on the state of all things, the cattle and the beef industry. So Kate, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you guys for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, for anybody who follows me on social media, you know, all I really like to talk about or argue about is the state of the beef industry. So uh, tonight we're going to do this web webinar a little bit different. Um, I'm going to actually present a PowerPoint presentation because we're going to get pretty deep in the weeds on pricing and how beef is priced. Because I think anybody who gets online currently uh, definitely the has seen the art the arguments about the mad rancher at the retail case trying to figure out why ribeyes are fourteen dollars and he's only getting paid a dollar five and so we're going to kind of walk through that process on how exactly beef is priced and how consumer trends um, affect packers and how packers uh, interface in in food service in retail so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get our PowerPoint up and going. See if I can do this. This is my first time sharing, um, sharing a screen. Most of these I'm just flapping my jaws, so hang tight with me. Okay, so we're, the, the title of tonight's conversation, and I do want it to be a conversation, so uh, if you have questions, feel free to pop up, um, and we'll answer those both at the end and kind of as we go along. Uh, but I call tonight's presentation the ribeye riot, uh, beef pricing from packer to plate. And I called it the ribeye riot because I've seen more than one ar you know, argument online about um, how frustrated we are as an industry, uh, I'm gonna move that around. how frustrated we are as an industry with how beef pricing works versus how cattle pricing works. And so uh, I kind of wanted to walk through that process. Um, so the phase one of this conversation uh, is what I'm gonna call the commodity conundrum. And your first key takeaway for tonight uh, is that cattle and beef are not the same commodity. Um, you cannot take a steer to a food bank. You cannot put a steer on a retail shelf, uh, much in the same way that you can't run beef through a chute and you can't put beef in a pasture. We really have to stop thinking about these two commodities as being anything more than related. Um, and, and so if you, if you need to take a heart pill, go ahead and do that, because I promise as we walk through this, I'm probably going to escalate some people's blood pressure just in the and how I think about some things and how the, the industry on the other side of the Packers think about some things. Uh, so bear with me. Um, 
So tonight's big questions that we're going to talk about is why is a ribeye at Ruth's Chris $56 and I'm only getting $1.05 for fed cattle? Uh, this really goes back to a lot of the social media arguments that I'm seeing, um, both, you know, on the, the, the side of the, the upset rancher at cattle prices, and that is a very valid emotion uh, when beef prices are not reflective of the struggles that we face on the beef side, on the cattle side of things. And also um, for the, the beef producers that are now starting to dip their toes into the water of beef processing, um, we, we need to understand how beef arrives at that final consumer price. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to go through pricing all the way through. We're going to get really into the weeds on it. I'm going to ruin eating out for you probably for the rest of your life uh, because you'll be able to look at a menu after this conversation and know, are they buying prime? Are they buying upper two thirds? Are they buying choice? Uh, you, you'll understand how we arrived at those menu prices. And then we're also going to talk, uh, go into the real nitty gritty about where beef goes once it leaves the packer desk and how it's priced to the consumer and what the consumer looks for in each of these channels. Uh, they are wildly different in terms of what consumers are looking for in food service, what consumers are looking for in exports, what consumers are looking for at retail. And so we're going to talk about how, how the consumer impacts uh, those decisions. So Dr. Evil is kind of what I think most cattlemen perceive the Packer sales desk to be, is just the, the guy on the phone trying to figure out how cheap he could buy cattle and then how much he can you know, squeeze out of the consumer. And, <laughs> and I say that as a joke. Um, the, the real irony is, is that a lot of us on the meat side are actually farm kids. There's, there's more than one of us, actually, I would say the, the gross majority of people that I work with on the packer side of the industry uh, came from an ag background. And a lot of us ended up in meat because we saw the struggles our parents had on the farm or we knew that if we were going to farm, we needed a secondary source of income to support that habit. And, and we found a home, uh, a pretty unique niche in the meat side of things. Um, so where does beef go once it gets into the box? Um, and I'm going to dispel with a couple common myths here. Uh, everything that a packer sells is sold fresh. Packers have limited to no on-site storage. Um, so there's some, some things going around social media right now that say that, you know, Walmart or the packers are sitting on warehouses full of frozen beef and they're, they're doing this just to screw the consumer. And that's simply not true. Cold storage isn't a, a storage unit. Uh, for beef processors. 90% um, of everything that goes into cold storage is bound for export um, and, of the, is, and is owned by somebody else. So packers sell this product to the, the end user and they put it in cold storage. Um, of the 90% that's not owned by packers, that 10% that's mostly off all, that they use cold storage as an aggregate to aggregate that product uh, to be ready to export. Um, freezing beef is expensive. So it costs about $800 per trailer load uh, to put product through a blast freezer. And then you're looking at at least another $1,000 a month to hold it. So that's an expensive process for boxed beef. Uh, not only that, but freezing beef lowers its intrinsic value. Uh, retailers are not allowed to sell beef that's been previously frozen without labeling it as such. So you, if you go to a store and they're selling beef that has been previously frozen, they have to label it as previously frozen beef. On the food service side, um, freezing beef stops the aging process and shortens the shelf life at the consumer. Um, so there, there's really no advantage to freezing beef and thawing it out and and trying to, to make it palatable again from the consumer standpoint. The goal really is in the supply pipeline to keep beef fresh, um, and, and we'll go through what that looks like for both food service and retail. Uh, exports account for 13% of our total trade volume. Uh, this is pre-COVID numbers. Um, it's mostly off-all uh, and then frozen trade like we talked about that goes to cold storage. Uh, retail accounts for 37% of trade volume in food service it has the lion's share of what we do in the beef industry at 51% uh, of total poundage. Uh, so walking kind of through the order process, there's been a lot of confusion about how 
packers and retailers or food service uh, distributors work together. And, and so we'll start kind of at the 30,000 foot level and work our way through. So packers and food service, retail, national accounts, uh, they make yearly contracts um, through the RFP process, a request for proposal. So uh, food service distributors and retailers and national accounts, people that are using a significant volume of product will approach a packer or a packer will approach them one way or the other, and they will commit to a certain volume on certain products. So it kind of gives both agencies the opportunity to um, get a good idea of availability and, and what that's going to look like throughout the year, uh, kind of just uh, set the tone for how they're going to go to market together. Um, packers are required, frankly, to, to pay a marketing agreement to work with broadline distribution or retailers. Uh, some cattlemen call this the pay to play scheme and, and that's probably accurate, uh, but what it does is it, it allows an allotment on a per pound or a set fee basis uh, for packers to come participate in industry trade shows, to interface with customers, to buy retail features. And so, you know, this accounts for a significant amount of money that goes directly to uh, the distributor or the retailer to be able to finance marketing activities um, that surround these products. And so that's part of the RFP process is that uh, everybody comes to the table and says, hey, you know, based on historic trends, this is what we think we're going to sell based on, uh, you know, account agreements, this is what we're going to have this year, um, and kind of where things start. Uh, now, the PO cycle, the purchase order cycle, is something that's gotten a lot of attention the media lately because of product allocation. So you go to the grocery store and you get the little nasty gram that says, hey, would you please only buy one package of ground beef or one gallon of milk? Um, you know, we're trying to conserve inventory levels. And you see, get on social media and you see people, um, you know, depopulating hog farms or dumping milk and you're like, why is this happening? Um, when the grocery store is only letting me buy so much. And the reason for that is that this doesn't happen in real time. So manufacturing, transportation, getting it on the shelf uh, is not a real time process. From the moment the PO is cut, it's a seven to 10 day minimum uh, to get that order placed, to get that product delivered. Uh, this is the, the just in time delivery mechanism that you know, we've had for decades. Uh, the end user, the retailer or the distributor, either one, will, uh, their buyer based on their historic par levels will send a PO to the packer. Uh, the packer will schedule production and confirm what he can or cannot fill. Uh, for instance, this week, today, I just got confirmations on what packers are going to, to fill of our orders for next week. And that ranges from zero to, you know, 90%. Um, they confirm, you know, at what price and uh, at what volume. The packer, based on those POs at that point in time, schedules production, uh, production confirms the PO with the customer and then scheduled production on their end in terms of procuring cattle um, and getting the fabrication schedule for the next week lined out. Um, once box beef is then created, uh, it is immediately moved off the docks. Like I said, packers have very limited on-site storage. And depending on the method of transportation, whether the retailer or distributor is running their own truck or they're using less than truckload commercial trucking, it's a two to seven day transit time uh, to get to its place of destination. So for me as a buyer, I cut a PO on a Monday, that PO is confirmed on Wednesday, and I usually receive that product the following Monday or Tuesday. Uh, once it comes into my inventory, I'm then, it usually takes about a day to get everything slotted, uh, and I'm able at that time to start selling product to customers. So that's why we have allocation happening at the retail level, because if I put all of my product out on Tuesday and it's sold out Tuesday afternoon, shoppers for me from Wednesday to Sunday don't get to buy milk or don't get to buy beef. And, and that's what would really create some social problems as far as retail runs. Um, and real panic at the consumer level. So retailers are doing what they can to kind of institute some normalcy in buying trends uh, to counteract that emotionality. 
Uh, there was a question asked is, is it a competitive bid process? I mean, like every sales channel, this is relationship based, but yes, it's highly competitive. Um, both the RFP process is in terms of how product gets bid on an annual basis and how things are bid on a weekly basis. Uh, every buyer, you know, has a show list and, and they go through and they confirm based on, you know, what fits their current needs best. A lot of the, the pricing mechanism is availability dependent and it is highly seasonal. So on, you know, in food service, tenderloins and ribeyes, the month of November and December are worth a gold brick. You can't hardly find them. But in the spring, they soften up. And so, you know, we know to anticipate certain trends at certain times of year and, and buy accordingly. There has been a rise of formula transactions based on RFP, uh, RFPs on the, the consumer end. Uh, national and regional accounts that are trying to really watch their bottom lines um, are agreeing to a volume on a weekly basis based on a set margin. Uh, and that's going to vary by packer and vary by um, distributor on how that works. But, but we've seen really the guys that are really have a significant footprint in the market as far as buying power, being able to go to the packers and say, hey, we're going to request this set margin. Um, retail and food service are wildly different in product request. Um, and so that allows the markets to compete in different ways. So retail is going to be really be focused on ground beef and, uh, and while food service is really focused on, on middles. So we're going to talk about food service first since it is the share of our business. Uh, like I said before, food service represents 51% of beef's total volume in terms of consumption. It's going to be the price driver behind high choice and prime values, as well as the drive behind beef programs such as certified Angus beef or and anything that falls into that category. Distribution is really split into multiple avenues. Um, just like in the packing sector, we have the big three or big four. Uh, Cisco definitely dominates that space in terms of market share. U.S. Foods follows them. And then you have other national distributors like performance food groups. Then you have regional distributors, um, Benny Keith and Gordon in the Southeast. You have Shamrock in the Southwest, Reinhardt in the Midwest. Uh, you have regional guys that have a pretty big footprint but don't compete nationally. And then independent distributors, every state, every um, large metropolitan area is going to have a handful of independent distributors. Um, a lot of these guys have actually formed a cooperative known as Unipro and kind of leveraged to their buying power in the market. So they come to the table with a larger buying footprint, which helps them um, you know, be more competitive um, with the big guys. So that's kind of your grocery sellers. Those are the guys that you're going to see the trucks down up and down your street. Those are the guys that are going to have sales reps going door to door at restaurants. Um, and then from there, you've got further processors in the meat space, at least. Um, people like Buckhead or Martin Preferred Foods or Halpern's or John Soles. These are guys that are going to buy boxed beef from a packer and turn it into an, a product uh, that they sell to distributors like cut steaks or fajitas or chicken fried steaks, things that the, don't, the packers don't fabricate, um, but, but are necessary to the restaurant world. And then you have specialty vendors like Heartbrand for Farms, 44 Farms, really integrated programs that own the cattle that have set up um, or, or found chain space to have product harvested and then also control their sales pipelines. So really a step further than a branded beef program in terms of you know, truly integrating their supply chain. Um, but ultimately through food service, all purchases end up on a purchased plate. Someone buys a plate. So whether that's a national account like Chili's, you know, regional account like here in Oklahoma, we have Brahms, or street accounts like your mom and pop steakhouses or, or hamburger places. Um, but this also uh, includes healthcare institutions like jails, uh, all of your elementary schools and colleges, as well as your restaurants. So that's kind of the, the quick overview of of what constitutes food service. Food service customer demands um, are kind of split into two arenas. So you've got the, the customers that are really focused on quality. 
in terms of branded and branded beef programs are the reign supreme in this area. Uh, certified Angus beef is definitely one of the major forces. Uh, you have farm specific programs like Heartbrand or 44 Farms that have really come on strong in the last decade. Um, most of the branded beef programs really model that CAB kind of uh, upper two-thirds choice, some kind of breed specification. It's usually Angus, even though we all know that Angus doesn't mean Angus. Um, in my 10 years, I've never had a customer ask about origin. I've sold all across the United States to every tier of accounts, and I've never been asked about country of origin. I've been asked about farm of origin because storied product that's backed by a branded beef program is really popular. Um, and backed by high quality marketing. So, so customers uh, on the restaurant side of things, they wanna know their rancher. They wanna know the story of this product so that when they're selling that 40 to $60 steak, they can put that smack dab in the middle of their menu and tell this warm and fuzzy story about how this rancher loved this cow all the way through. Uh, they're, not, they're not picky about origin in the uh, the scheme of a branded beef program. It's just not a conversation that comes up. Uh, and that's really because sales reps and chefs know very little about food production and they really care even less about the down and dirty of every day on the farm. Uh, they really care about buzzwords like local, uh, antibiotics, uh, Midwestern corn fed beef is a big one that we throw around. Uh, they want to talk about hormones. They want to talk about how the product was raised in terms of animal welfare. Uh, but they really don't get into the, the nitty gritty of diets and, and some of the things that we argue about in the industry. So that's going to be the customers that are focused on your middle meats primarily, your ribeyes, your strips, your tenders. Um, they're really focused on those, those branded beef programs. Anybody that's buying outside of that is buying on price. And a lot of people that buy within that are buying on price. Um, Culinary trends in this segment really influence retail trends later on, uh, and we'll talk more about that. So this is kind of how product flows through the food service industry. It starts at the packer sales desk, and then it's going to be sold to either a further processor or a distributor. The further processor is going to take boxed beef and turn it into cut steaks or turn uh, it into fajitas or, or chicken fried steaks. It's, they're going to take that 80 pound packer case and turn it into something that a restaurant can immediately use. Um, and they're going to sell that product back to a distributor or they're going to sell it directly to an end user. Either that or a packer is going to sell box beef directly to a distributor and the distributor is going to take that 80 pound box case uh, and sell it directly to an end user. So we have two different types of customer in the food service industry, the one that's capable of using boxed beef. Um, so end users who cut their own steaks or end users that are using briskets for barbecue, or you have the customer that wants a cut steak or a further processed item uh, that's going to rely on an intermediary processor to, to make that a usable product. So I promised you that you'd be able to talk about why your steak cost $50 at Ruth's Chris, right? So that's what we're going to break down here. And it's important to understand that the USDA boxed price is where things start uh, on paper for this conversation. But understand that if a national account has a formula price with a packer, uh, that could be something like USDA minus a dime or USDA minus a nickel. Um, as their starting point. So today I pulled uh, the box beef prices off of today's report. So we're going to walk through pricing a ribeye, a center cut strip, and a center cut tenderloin all the way through uh, further processing through the distributor and through a menu analysis to, to arrive at that final, that final price point. So box prices today, we'll start with the ribeye, were $9.96. Um, I'm going to add 40 cents in freight, which is kind of the industry average um, for, for a truckload. Um, you're going to add 40 cents per pound to get it from the packer to the processor or the distributor's door. And that arrives at a raw material cost of $10.36. Um, this raw material cost is 
where processors or distributors will start conversations on how they're pricing meat. So that is their delivered price. Um, it's important that at this point in time to kind of point out that raw material cost is often uh, have, we'll, we'll go through this in a second about how it's a blended inventory based on aging. Um, but for the sake of argument, we'll start with 1036 and say that all of their inventory costs. The, the most important part of this conversation is converting raw material costs to yielded meat costs. And, and that will be the foundation for what this meat block actually costs the processor. Um, in, in part of that conversation, we're going to look at some pictures here because when I tell you that the, the boxed beef ribeye, the, the yield to get that to a cut steak is 72%, you're going to scratch your head and wonder where that 30% goes. And it gets worse on center cut strips where the average industry yield is 50%. And the same for tenderloins, which is, you know, 48 to 52% on a tenderloin as well. Um, so we're going to look at those pictures real fast and I'll come back and walk you through yielded meat costs. This is what a beef tenderloin looks like when it comes out of Packer Cryovac. If you were to take this, if you bought this at Sam's um, or from a distributor and you took it home and you cut cut steaks out of that right there, it would be the worst eating experience of your life. You probably would not ever eat a filet again. Uh, it's got silver skin, it's got the chain on it, it would be gristled and gnarly it'd be terrible it'd be the like i said the worst beef eating experience of your life especially when you're buying a 50 dollars filet or this piece of meat like right now would be 90 dollars for this whole tenderloin you're expecting a really high quality eating experience so how do we take this hunk of beef and turn it into something usable and this picture kind of illustrates that so we'll start with the ribeye the industry yield on a ribeye is 72%. And what I mean by that is that we're gonna come in and we're gonna take this tail off. There's usually a one inch or two inch tail. We'll block that off and then we'll square up the ends. So you've got the chuck end of the ribeye where you're going to have a lot of muscle separation here. Uh, we'll square that out. And we'll do the same thing on the loin end. If you're a meathead and you get a loin end ribeye, you're going to be really mad about it because there's not a lot of spinalis there and you're going to think somebody sold you a strip. So to square that up and to make sure that we don't have a lot of customer complaints, we'll clip the ends on these so we get a more uniform uh, ribeye from end to end. The tenderloin is a different uh, beast altogether. Um, as we see here, uh, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to peel the silver skin off of it, you're going to denude it of fat, and then you're going to take the chain off, cut off the tenderloin tail and the tenderloin head, and then this, this middle tube is where we're going to cut steaks out of. That's going to be your high-end eating experience. This chain is all going to go to uh, cook primarily, uh, and then out of the tender, tender tips we'll make uh, filet medallions, and out of the tenderloin head, we'll cut metro fillet. So there will be some drop credit there, but it will be small because it's a residual. And then on the strip, little known fact that 50% of a strip loin has this vein that runs through it. And if you're looking at the PowerPoint, you can see where that points to it. And <laughs> we only sell center cut strips to fine dining establishments uh, because if you sell two strips to a table and one of them gets a center cut and one of them gets a vein, um, the guy that gets the vein is going to slap your waitress uh, with a really nasty steak. That vein is inedible. Uh, it's, you can't cut it. You can't chew it. Um, so to really prevent end user problems, we sell primarily center cut strips. So there'll be a drop credit for this vein steak, but we sell them as vein steaks uh, for you know five dollars or so, or we run them through a cuber and make high end chicken fried steaks out of them. Uh, but, you know, for all of you who want to start a butcher shop or a, a restaurant of your own, these are things to keep in mind. Um, you can't just take boxed beef and cut steaks willy-nilly in the back or you're going to have some serious customer concerns um, up front. So that's kind of the yield process. We'll go back and talk about um, how we get to yielded meat cost again. So you've seen what it takes to break one down. Um, I'm going to go ahead and allot... A um, dollar twenty-five drop credit uh, because we will be able to salvage some of the strip and some of the tenderloin, um, and that brings us to a yielded meat cost of fourteen fifth fourteen forty for ribeyes, 
uh, $22.85 for center cut strips and $25.33 for center cut tenderloins. And this is where a lot of cattlemen's head explodes. I know mine did when I started. Um, how, you're telling me that box beef is $12 and, and you haven't even started putting in expenses yet and we're gonna charge a customer $25 for a center cut tenderloin? Um, yeah. And so then we start talking about processor markups. Um, so yielded meat cost is the jumping off point. Um, the industry average is about 15 cents for labor, another seven cents for packaging that includes cryovac and the box, and then overhead of another 15%, which overhead would, or 15 cents, overhead would be utilities, machinery, the cost of the building, taxes. Um, and then we add in marketing and earned income. And marketing is going to be that, that pay to pay, pay to play scheme. Um, often, as we sell into a distributor, there'll be a, a marketing fee for us. And then the income shelter is where we, you know, finance credits, um, spoilage, things that happen on the consumer end that we have to, to make whole. Um, and that brings us to kind of the base price. Um, for a ribeye would be $14.87, for a center cut strip would be $23.32, and for a beef tenderloin would be $25.80. Uh, from there, most processors are going to put somewhere in the ballpark of 12 to 18 percent margin, um, and that's you know to cover to cover all of the other expenses and try to to put a little profit in the bank, and that's what we would call our sales cost. Now, there's things to consider as you're walking through this, thinking that sounds like an awful lot of money. Um, we don't age anything at the packer level, and on the restaurant side of things, customers will not buy product that doesn't have at least 21 days age on it. The industry standard is 28 to 35 days. Aging costs money and aging comes with risk. So these processors and distributors will buy this product, put it in their warehouse and sit on it for four weeks um, and, and ride out both market highs and market lows. That's been one of the real concerns with COVID is that inventory price is just all over the board. Um, and with that aging process, there, there comes spoilage and shrink. Um, and if you have a pinhole in a packer cryovac, that product goes bad. If a guy hits a pallet with a forklift, if the sprinklers go off in the cooler, uh, there's all sorts of things to consider when you're holding inventory for that long. And then the cost of equipment to run a processing floor is really expensive. Well, you have machinery that, that easily costs anywhere between 50 to a quarter million dollars, um, 50,000 to a quarter of a million dollars, and then all of the labor components that go into that. Um, so there's a lot of expenses that, that happen on that side of the, the equation that we don't often think about it in, in production. So at that point, the sales cost, it's sold to a broadline distributor for distribution or it's sold directly to a customer. So some customers who prefer to buy directly from uh, processors, that the sales cost would be what they started their menu price with. Uh, but most customers are utilizing broadline distribution um, to buy all their steaks, all their paper goods, all their produce. Uh, they have one truck that comes. It costs money every time that they have someone opened their back door to receive product in. We did an industry study and it cost a customer $30 every time uh, in terms of labor and time uh, to open their door. Um, so from the broadline side, uh, they bring that product in and then it's split into two different categories. So street business is where there's a sales rep that goes door to door uh, that has his own book, his or her own book of business and maintains those client relationships. These are independent restaurants um, on a city basis. And, and so that, that process, there would be a freight charge, usually about 15 cents. This is a, steaks would be a just-in-time pickup. Uh, so the steak cutter, this processor, would be within a three to four hour drive of a broadline distributor. So they would usually run those trucks themselves. So the freight component is less. Um, and then that gets them to a delivered cost. Most broadline distributors are gonna put four to 6% of house margin on this product. And that gets, uh, gets a sales rep, his sales cost essentially. And most sales reps are gonna put another 4% on center of the plate business. Um, if a, a sales rep controls the center of the plate, he usually owns most of the business in the account. Um, the center of the plate is what consumer, the, 
restaurant owners watch the closest. It's their biggest cost. Um, so the, the pricing structure on that side is very competitive. Um, so it's a very low margin item for food service reps, uh, but a very important item because if they maintain that business, like I said, they usually control the rest of the account. So for street business, um, it's a little bit higher margin. For program business, which would be our roots, Chris, would fall into that. Customers that, that buy a significant volume, they would be on a different margin structure. So there would be delivered costs, same, they buy it from the processor, they put a small freight charge on it, and then they put a set markup on it based on purchase volume. Um, for, for these prices, the industry average is somewhere between $1.25, which is really aggressive, and, and $2.50 uh, per pound on margin. So that brings us to how broadliners sell product into restaurants. Some things to consider from the broadline aspect is that they too are aging products. So they have, you know, four to six weeks worth of inventory on hand to manage. Um, they have things to consider like broken boxes or box damage, mispicks. If one of their cooler employees picks a box of ribeyes instead of a box of strips, that's money that they lose. And then, of course, returns and credits um, that they have to negotiate with the customer. Um, those things aren't passed back to the packer. If there's a problem with the product, it's the broadline distributor's responsibility or the processor's responsibility uh, to make that right. Now, if there's a, you know, a run of product in one lot that they've had problems with, they'll pass that on to the packer to fix. But most of the time, uh, it's really on the, the dist distribution side to keep the customer happy. So here I ruin eating out for everyone. Um, this is how restaurants are going to price their meals. So we have the ribeye, the cinder cut strip, and the beef tenderloin that we've been following along. And now that we've gotten what their sales cost is, we're going to go through and menu cost this for them. So if the ribeye costs them $18.50 to buy, uh, most food service operators on the customer side, they're wanting to run about a 33% food cost, meaning that the cost of the product on the plate is 33% of the total menu price. So they'll take 33%. That puts a menu cost of $56 for that ribeye. Pretty on the nose. <laughs> and I didn't plan it that way, actually, for why a Roos Chris ribeye is $56. That's exactly what it comes out to be today. Um, so most food service operators at this point in time would round that one way or the other. Um, with what they feel comfortable with. Oftentimes beef is a loss leader on a menu, so they run a food cost closer to 50% to keep that, that price down. So if you go to your local steakhouse and they're only charging you, you know, $21 or $28 for a steak, know that they're not making a whole lot per plate on that item, or they're selling you maybe a no-roll product, um, something or frozen injected product. Um, they're finding a way to, to cut cost either um, on the quality of product that they serve, or they're not making enough money on that plate. So that would leave gross, prod gross profit for that ribeye at $37 a plate, and that sounds really, really high. Uh, but this is before we start talking about net profit. Um, so gross profit of $37, industry average target for labor and overhead is 35% of menu cost. Um, so we tack that in, which would leave a net profit of $17 a plate, um, which would be about 32% profit that they would take to the bank. If a restaurant had 150 seats, which that's a pretty big steakhouse, um, and they, they turn those one time, which most places that are high-end dining expect a, a one-time turn, um, that would be a total profit uh, if they just sold the three steaks in their mix of about $2,600 a night, if they figured 32% profit. The unfortunate part is, is that the industry average profit margin for a restaurant is 7%. And if a hot, fine dining steakhouse isn't careful um, at a 7% profit margin based on those menu prices, um, that would only be about $500 a night that they put in the bank. So this is my TED talk on why restaurants go out of business so quickly is they don't manage expenses or they don't allot their food costs properly, which comes back to, to customers who maybe cut their own steaks and don't catch their yields. And so they don't really know what their per plate cost is. 
Um, and then there's other things to consider. You know, if a waitress drops a plate, I waited tables all through college, I've dropped more than one. That comes right out of the profit margin. If a steak is over sent back, it just goes in the tracks, $18.50 that they lost. If there's a customer complaint and they have to comp a meal, same thing. And then theft is a huge problem um, on the restaurant side. Uh, so controls are really a push within the industry right now um, to, to reduce some of the, the groceries that walk out of a restaurant. So now you know why your steak costs fifty six dollars, um, <laughs> and it's not always pretty, but that's that's kind of how the industry prices uh, box beef from trailer to plate. And so now we'll talk about retail. We'll go through the same thing. Uh, retail is thirty seven percent of our consumption by volume. Uh, Sixty three percent of total purchases are in ground beef. And I think that's really important to point out because ground beef is the competitor in the retail case with chicken and pork in terms of value. It's also really malleable. Beef has not been a leader in the ready to eat category and beef is really hard to cook. Let's be honest. Um, if you screw up a steak at home, you've screwed up dinner uh, where ground beef is pretty malleable. You can make tacos, you can make spaghetti. If you burn it a little bit, it doesn't matter. You can always tell when it's done and when it's not. Uh, ground beef will continue to lead that category, both in terms of price and usability. Beef is the most expensive item in a grocery store cooler case, other than fish for the most part. And so that's something that we have to keep in mind anytime that we uh, want to make changes on, on the cattle side or the regulatory side, we have to think about how that impacts consumer buying decisions. If they're faced with you know, $8 to $10 pound ground beef, are they going to swap that out for the five to six dollar package of pork chops? Are they going to swap that out for the seven to nine dollar chicken breast, which might go a little further? Uh, we have to be very cognizant of beef pricing in the retail case since ground beef is so clearly the leader. Uh, consumer demand metric is totally different on the retail side than it is in restaurants. So where restaurants is all about quality and consistency and and they really rely on aging. Um, the, the retail customer wants no aging. Uh, the, most, the first thing that they look at is the color. So when you walk up to a beef case, most customers, they really want that bright red, cherry red color in their meat, which means it's pretty green in terms of age. Uh, you're looking at seven to 10 days. It, it comes off the packer floor, it goes pretty much immediately to a processor, to a meat case. And then the second thing that they look at on that price is how much does it is the price. How much does this cost? So does the meat look good and is the meat affordable to me? Those are really the first two things um, that customers look at. So retail is kind of the same distribution channel. It's going to come from a packer to either a distributor like affiliated grocery. Um, that would be a grocery distributor who, who supplies smaller independent grocery chains uh, similar to how we do in food service, or it's going to go to a processor and then to a major retailer. Uh, it's really a fallacy that any retailers are buying sides of ground beef and processing them in house. We just don't have the manpower for that these days. The only places that I really know of that are that are taking quarters or sides are some whole food uh, restaurant, whole foods in, in major metropolitan areas, and they take one or two of those as a show, uh, and then they have everything else brought in as box beef. Um, it, finding reliable help at the grocery level to run a butcher shop in-house uh, is hard to do. And then it's also really expensive. Uh, you have to have some, somewhere to go with your trim and things. Um, and if there's a processor that will do that at a certain margin, um, most people have found that it's more cost effective to have that done off-site and then brought in. So pricing considerations on the retail side Obviously, you're going to have lots of inventory blending based on what you buy this, what comes in next week, and also based on local competition. Marketing agreements are really important in this segment. Um, you're going to see up to 30% feature rebates based on the seller. So if you're a processor selling into a high-end grocer, uh, you will price in somewhere between 15 and 30% of your sales cost in marketing so that they can run retail features, which is essentially a sale on your items. Uh, retail pricing is highly seasonal and highly volatile. 
Um, and then shrink is really the biggest concern for most retailers. Uh, beef is commonly one of the most stolen items um, in a retail environment. Um, and it's also one of the items uh, that's the most highly perishable. So there's always the, the yellow tag for sale bin. I encourage you if you're brave enough to shop out of that, that's gonna have a lot of, you know, it's gonna have a little bit more age on it and sometimes, you know, the product's just fine, but you're also gonna have shrink in terms of people walking through the store that decide later on, hey, I really can't afford to buy this today and that package of ground beef ends up in the cereal aisle. Well, that gets thrown away. Or you've got a cooler that ran hot that day, that product gets thrown away. So shrink is really a huge component of retail pricing. So we'll go through and we'll price the same ribeye in the same strip, um, just to kind of look at the cost difference. So we know that on the food service side, it ended up being a $50 to $60 mini plated item. On the retail side, however, box beef, same box beef pricing, uh, a 15% marketing agreement, you'll have 40 cents in freight to get it to where it's going. And that leaves you with a delivered price um, of somewhere around $12 for both ribeyes and strips. The yield is a little bit better in a retail environment because they're not so concerned with product consistency. Um, and you don't really worry about vein steaks on the strip side. There's always a vein steak in a retail package. So your yields are closer to 75%, putting your yielded meat cost um, a little bit lower at 15, almost $16 for ribeyes and $16.50 for cut strips. Uh, and then they put usually a 28% margin on, uh, which covers all of their overhead in terms of utilities, uh, space, rent, uh, taxes, shrink, labor, all of those things come out of that 28% margin for a sales cost of $21.95 and $22.89 for choice strips. And I'd imagine that I'm pretty close to accurate on, on what shelf pricing will be next week uh, for cut steaks. But ground beef is not the same. And we've talked about how ground beef was really the leader in the retail category. Ground beef is a least cost formulation by blending different chemical lean points. And what I mean by that is that we don't sell <coughs> boxes of trim just willy nilly. Um, all trim is really formulated uh, and, and traded on load lot basis based on its lean percentage. So 90s, 85s, 73s, 50s, those are pretty popular chemical lean points, um, meaning that it's 90% lean to 10% fat, or 50% lean to 50% fat. Um, 81s and up is usually cow kill and imports, um, but, but some, we, we do harvest uh, a, some cow kill is 50s. Um, and then chucks, so if you're doing a whole muscle grind, chucks, um, are usually considered 75. So if you grind whole muscle chuck, it comes out to be about a 75-25 blend. Um, and so we'll go through the pricing strategy on that real quick. So we use a Pearson square um, to kind of formulate what percentage of 90s and 50s we need. And I did an 80-20 calculation based on a 20,000 pound run. Most ground beef processors need at least 1,000 pounds to do a run. Uh, that, that makes the machinery run at peak capacity. Most, uh, that's for a smaller side. Um, for a larger side, you know, five to 10,000 pound runs are pretty standard. So we'll walk through um, the raw material cost on that today. 90s traded at 266, 50s traded at 290. That's the equivalent of pigs flying to see 50s trading higher than 90s, but it's a weird time. Uh, you'll have that same freight component of 40 cents to get the load to where it's going for a delivered cost um, of 306 for 90s and 330 for 50s. And then based on the Pearson square, we need 15,000 pounds of 90s and 5,000 pounds of 50s to get an 80-20 run. So we'll price that out. That 20,000 20, pound run would cost $62,400 in meat, breaking that down to a $3.12 per pound. Uh, raw material cost. Uh, you'll have a three to five percent uh, yield loss based on machinery, so ground beef that hangs on the side of the, the blades or gets caught up in tubing, uh, we account for that. And then labor packaging and overhead, uh, retail marketing, another freight component to take it from the processor to the retailer, and then the retail margin again of 28 percent gives you a 542 uh, cost for retail ground beef. 
uh, an 80-20 blend. Uh, you'll see more expensive ground beef on the shelf. Uh, that's 90-10 or 93-7. That's really popular, super lean. Uh, and you'll see cheaper ground beef that's closer to that 73-27 mark. Um, we control costs really by, con by controlling what you know, chemical lean point we, we grind to. So I missed this on my other screen, but imports in the ground beef sector is really less about uh, product quality or product price as it is uh, risk management on availability. So about 32 weeks a year, you can find all of the domestic trim that you need. Those other 16 weeks, it's really hard to source raw material. Um, JBS is not importing live cattle. I read that on social media earlier this week that um, apparently JBS is bringing in boatloads of cattle to fill uh, their feedlots in the Midwest. That's not true, just so that you know. Uh, boat transport for a live animal is about 30, 47 cents a pound. I'm sorry, I have a gold behind to play. Um, <laughs> And so it's really not feasible from a price standpoint to, to boat animals into Houston and then transfer them the 666 miles from Houston to Amarillo uh, and, and then have them arrive at a feedlot. That doesn't make any financial sense. The same way Smithfield is not taking pigs to China and harvesting them in back. That's just not how we do business. Uh, percent of our domestic product uh, that we consume is imported. Uh, but 72% of that total product is bound for food service. So uh, this is going to be risk mitigation for the McDonald's of the world, for instance, the people who are serving burgers all day, every day, seven days a week. <laughs> she found another duck. I apologize. I've ignored her all day, and this is what we get. Um, and they're selling those burgers at the same price. And so they can forward contract raw material for a set amount of time on an annual basis and they know what their cost of goods is going to be. Uh, we export most of our thin meats to Asia at a premium. And I, what I mean by thins are your inside and outside skirts. So we import skirt from South America, primarily Uruguay, and that goes into fajita production for Hispanic restaurants. Uh, I will tell you that if you've eaten fajitas and they didn't cost $60 a plate, you ate imported product, uh, unless they were cutting it out of cheek or clawed or something along those lines. If it was imported, if it was skirt and it was under $60, it was imported and it's delicious. You don't know the difference. And all of these products would be in cool exempt, uh, meaning that even if we pass mandatory country of origin labeling, 72% of the imports into this country wouldn't have a label. There's really no place to slap on McDonald's menu that this might be a product of Australia or New Zealand or Uruguay. Um, and then, you know, USDA inspected, on imports, USDA inspects those plants within the country. They inspect them again at the port. They inspect them at the processor prefab and at the processor postfab. Uh, all of these products are highly inspected. Um, and I would really encourage the industry to stop creating food safety concerns where there are none. We've seen that Namibia post pop up a hundred times in the last week uh, and somebody has attached a wet market photo to it. That's not accurate. And that's creating some real food safety issues at the consumer level where they no longer have confidence in the product that we deliver. And, and that won't affect imported product because they don't know where imported products going. That's going to affect all beef products. And it's simply not true. There's a healthy dose of American exceptionalism going on here. And I hate to bust anybody's bubble and make your blood pressure go up, but I've been in a lot of these foreign plants. And quite frankly, some of them are newer than ours. And so the, some of the misinformation going around is really outrageous. Um, if you want to jump in and, and get rid of imports, the best way to do that would be to build a cow kill facility and promise a consistent supply that would help your cull cow value and it would solve a market problem. Um, on that note, uh, Australian and New Zealand, where we get the primary amount of our lean trim, has actually been more expensive than domestic product for a year. Um, there's just not a place to get domestic cow kill consistently. So we'll talk about the export pipeline briefly. That makes up 13% of our total sales volume. Um, and I'll tell you that I get probably 10 calls a week from somebody wanting to export. 
and the calls go something like, hi, I'm a made up name from Hong Kong and I'd like to buy 400 million metric tons of beef omasum and pork trotters and chicken paws. And this is usually the part of the conversation where I stop listening. There, there seems to be a ton of export demand, um, but what we're seeing rise in is really the risk of gray channel smuggling. Um, phytosanitary non-compliance is a huge deal in terms of plant, um, how do I want to phrase that? If, so if we send a, a, if a trader sends a load of product to, to Hong Kong and it gets popped in a phytosanitary raid of some kind, the inspection number on that box, that plant could lose uh, the opportunity to export to that country and to others uh, because it went through a gray channel. Hackers really have to have complete control supply chain to mitigate that risk. I still think that exports are the largest vector for growth for the U.S. beef market going forward. Um, so that's another real opportunity that if you have capital and want to get involved in, in beef production on the, the fed cattle side, uh, there are plenty of people globally that will jump in to have a secure uh, pipeline for fed beef. We have a lot of export challenges uh, surrounding COVID-19 that aren't really making a lot of mainstream news, especially in the wake of depopulation and things like that. Um, we have a global container shortage due to delayed transports. We have delayed or absent bookings and no departure dates. So the whole shipping supply pipeline uh, is pretty much devastated. Uh, China issued force majeure, force majeure certificates uh, for thousands of shipments that were sitting in um, and caught a lot of Brazilian and Australian uh, companies with, with containers in port that Chinese buyers were no longer responsible for and had no liability for, so they never got paid on. Um, and I think we're looking at a global reset for beef demand and beef pricing. With every recession, there has been a global price correction on beef specifically, and when processing resumes, we don't really know yet if that's going to happen here. So something to look forward to. So just a few consumer housekeeping questions that were asked in other presentations that I thought I'd throw in here. Um, beef industry, please, or cattle industry, please stop asking for new beef products like the Vegas Strip on the processing side. Um, God hasn't changed the conformational makeup of a fat steer. So the muscles that we've got are working just fine. We don't need new and exciting products. We need to keep making the ones we've got and improve on them. Um, the Vegas Strip, for instance, was a a project that came out that on the processing side was a disaster. You can't get the raw material for it. The raw material that you can get, it's really low yielding, it's really expensive for a product that really doesn't work at, at restaurant applications. Um, culinary trends start in high profile restaurants and they trickle down to the consumer on, in terms of retail demand. And we see that with pork belly. I think there's some opportunities to do things like that in beef, like aged beef at the, re the retail level. Um, to have some packaging and some consumer education around that. Uh, packers have created their own internal branded beef programs because of competition with CAB. Uh, packers cooperate with branded beef programs, but packers are ultimately just vendors. They're winning and losing sales like the rest of us. Um, so the, the, the nefarious packer relationship doesn't really exist on the consumer side or the retail or distribution side. We look at, at Packers as a vendor, someone that we're partners with and someone that we do vendors with, but, but ultimately there's, there's no bad blood there. They're just, you know, people we work with. So key takeaways that beef and cattle are not the same thing, that USDA box beef pricing is just the beginning. Yielded meat cost is the starting point for steak pricing. Retail and food service use the same products very differently, and there's a, a very diff, there's a lot of difference in being a price taker in terms of buying and being a price seller setter in terms of selling, and, and that's kind of how the, the industry cooperates from the packer through the distributor through to the customer. So let me switch back here, figure out how to do that. Yeah, I'm learning here. There should be a stop sharing button at the top. If not, stop it's no big deal. Uh, let's 
advanced. Man, I'm struggling right. here. Not a problem. We can keep moving through <laughs> some of the questions that we've had. Yeah, so. just start asking questions and I'll uh, I'll figure this screen out as we go. Hey, there you go. Um, so thank you, Kate, for all that in-depth information. We do have a few questions. And for those of you who are uh, participating um, via the webinar, not the call-in function, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So go ahead and shoot some questions our way. Uh, but the first question we have, so what is the carcass to box B field? Or can you talk about the carcass to box B field? Sure, so the Packer side of the pricing equation runs a lot differently. So uh, you, you have to walk through hot kill. Um, obviously in the, the average beef carcass is gonna yield 62% per, at that point in time. So from hot kill, you lose 40, 38%. Um, and that reestablishes your, your hundredweight price on the, on the rail side. Um, and then it kind of breaks down, the USDA does, I've not been involved in, in anything fed cattle related as far as pricing through a plant. I, I work really closely on cow kill side so I could work through that a little bit easier. Uh, so I don't wanna misspeak here. Um, but for instance, on ribeyes, um, ribeyes are make up only, I think 15% of the carcass weight by, or carcass by weight, but are 35% of the carcass by value. So at that point in time, it really breaks down into primal groups and then by subprimals based on weight uh, and value. So it's a little bit of voodoo magic, but it's all actually transparent with USDA in terms of box beef um, on the website there. Sure, super, thank you. So the next question is, on the distribution side, once beef leaves the big four packing plants, you have three mega distributors and two regionals, as you said during your presentation. Do you see true competitive market activity happening between these few companies, or do you see another oligopoly situation happening like we see on the packing industry level? Uh, no, I don't, because there's more than two regionals. I just work primarily in the southeast, and our two biggest, you know, regionals are, are going to be Gordon Food Service and Vinnie Keith. Um, in every region, there's going to be regional players, and in every region, there's going to be national players, that, and they're going to vary by strength by state. So in Texas, for instance, uh, you know, Houston, that's Cisco's backyard. Uh, Cisco's a dominant force in that market, so it's Benny Keith. U.S. Foods doesn't have much of a presence there, but if you jump over to Austin, um, Cisco's a dominant force, but U.S. Foods is right on their heels. So it really varies by city um, and by distribution house as to how competitive they are, and that really breaks down into the strength and tenure of their reps um, by institution. Um, so, you know, Benny Keith in the South, they have uh, they compensate their reps really well. Their reps are very tenured. They have very few new hires. They, they're all there for 10 plus years and they treat their employees really well. So, you know, with that comes a lot of strength and competitiveness on the Cisco side. They have a different model for how they hire reps. It's more like a used car salesman approach kind of these days. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> so, you know, and then you have your, your smaller players. I work for a smaller player and, and we have a different niche in that market. So for us, it takes fish of all sizes to make a, an ecosystem work, and, and there's a place for everyone. So no, I see a very healthy com and competitive marketplace where, you know, every day I, I'm with one of the little guys, and, and I have no problem competing with Cisco and U.S. Foods um, in different ways. Great. But it is so interesting how the market share is very similar. <laughs> So next question, do domestic and foreign consumers recognize or care about value-added programs such as the source and age, NHTC, verified natural, et cetera? If so, what does that mean in terms of value for ranchers and feeders and how should they, should they be participating in those programs? So that's an interesting one. So sometimes they care and sometimes they don't. It really depends on the restaurant and the owner and the chef um, and the program. So I will say that a lot of branded beef programs are pretty watered down. And a lot of these terms don't really mean anything, like natural doesn't mean anything in the, in the food service industry. Um, my recommendation for cattlemen wanting to diversify themselves at this point in time would be to latch on to some, to a, to a storied program like 44 Farms, for instance, um, and, and get involved in some consumer marketing from that angle. 
Um, obviously things like antibiotic usage and hormones and, and things like that are important to talk about, but really the only value added that I see currently really having a big impact is um, branded storied programs that, that start with the farm. I, this golden retriever is killing us. Ellie. <laughs> so it so starts with the farm. Yes. I, when she gets no attention, this is what happens. She's a tyrant. But um, so no, start with a story. The story matters more than any of the labels. That's what's going to resonate with the consumer. Um, they really like, they like seeing the guy in the cowboy hat and the mustache talk about cattle. That, that's what gives them warm fuzzies. The, how we raise cattle, um, the nitty gritty of it, they really don't care about. So you mentioned that on the retail side, then maybe there's maybe not much demand or people really don't necessarily care about those products. How about on the retail side? You said food service. So how about retail side? Do some of those branded products, I mean, is there is there consumers asking about that more so on the retail? So high-end markets, yes, you know, your Whole Foods buyers, but that's going to be about 15% of the marketplace. The vast majority of consumers um, really care more about color and price. I think it's going to be interesting to see how uh, the 44 Farms program with Walmart really rolls out. That's going to be a big tell on if the average consumer really cares about that story and how those markets um, and how that affects the 44 brand long term. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a market test right now. Does the average consumer really care about um, the story behind the product where historically that answer has been pretty much a resounding no as we look at how things sell in terms of what stays on a shelf and movement. Uh, price is still the, the primary driver. Uh, but I think that there's a, a growing set of customers, especially in the millennial age group, um, that, that care about that story and they use food as a status symbol. So, you know, when, when they can walk through the grocery store with whatever in their cart that makes them feel warm and fuzzy, they're willing to spend that extra money. Sure. Um, so next question is a comment and a question. So it says, Kate, excellent presentation. I agree. But how does the cattle feeder get his 28 to 30% profit margin? We seem to be on the negative margin game plan for about the past five years. Yeah, so as a cow-calf producer, I calculated my margin the other day, and I think my brothers and I can buy a Coke. Like, that's where we're at. Like, I get it. Like, it's just not there. And I see that struggle coming out in a couple places that our input costs are going up. I mean, buying a tractor will make you vomit in the parking lot these days, and, and the cost of hay implements and fertilizer and, and every implement, you know, every input that we've got, we have very little control over, and then we have very little control over that end market as well. Um, you know, for me, what we're doing at home, that's really the best that I can speak to. We can't change the fact that we in the commodity game are price takers. We just really can't. The best thing that we can do individually is add value to those products um, and, and try to differentiate ourselves within the marketplace to, to get some more of that change. Um, so for us, you know, that comes down to, to really focusing on genetics and, and finding ways to, to get into some of these niche programs that maybe add a dime or a nickel you know, here and there that might make the difference. I wish that there was a magic bullet that we could get, you know, $2, 240 you know, feeders back, but I, I'm not seeing that in our immediate future. And so um, until we can learn how to control the supply pipeline on the fed cattle, on the, well, on the cattle side, period, we're going to continue to struggle. Um, I, I think that in some areas, you know, my neighbors and I have talked about buying things as a group. Um, coming together and buying mineral in one big run, buying feed in one big run, buying, you know, sharing a cutter when we can and some things like that to kind of cut down on our inputs. That's, that's another thing that, that I'm doing on the local level just to kind of help. Um, some things that we maybe look into long term in terms of like the, the guys in Unipro on the food service side did, these small distributors are really having a hard time getting, you know, competitive bids. So they came together, they formed a buying group and, and they, you know, there's 400 small vendors now that, that have a pretty big footprint and command some market presence as a result of that. So maybe there's some opportunities to do that. The problem comes in is that when you need a tractor, you need a tractor, you need a thin, you can't wait on your neighbor to bring it back. And so, uh, you know, I don't really have a good answer for that, except, you know, just find ways to add value. As frustrating as that is. Yeah. All right. So um, I guess this next question, um, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised we haven't gotten more of these so far, but can you talk about alternative proteins and, um, you know, ah. you 
obviously sell, you know, the real thing. Uh, but when you're selling, you know, meat products and you're talking to folks in retail and distributing, does that ever come up in conversation or how much does that come up in conversation? So that was a big push this last year. I actually sell all groceries. So that's been something that has been brought through our, um, like our annual meetings when they come bring us and showcase new products. Um, I think there's a seat at the table for everybody. It's not our job to to make somebody's food decisions for them. Uh, food choice is highly personal. So if someone wants to be a vegetarian, uh, they have the right to do so. I have a chef here in Oklahoma City who believes that in 10 years, meat will be the side item. And, you know, that it, it's going away. That he, no, this is a hard market to sell that in. You know, that's going to be a tough pitch for him long term. But that's what he believes. And it's not my job to talk him out of that. It's my job to give him a product that fits his needs. And I don't, I think that through COVID, it really highlighted um, consumers' preferences. Uh, there's been a lot of viral pictures going around about how Beyond Meat is the only thing left in the case. And I think that we can kind of pat ourselves on the back that, hey, we're the OGs here. Everybody wants ground beef, but, but Beyond Meat is still sitting. I think it's important for us as an industry to get out in front of regulating it. That's really where we need to be, have the conversation is lab grown meat and beyond meat, and meat imitation, making sure that it's labeled as such and not letting what happened to the dairy industry happen to us. You know, if we'd called almond milk nut juice 10 years ago, <laughs> almond milk would not be nearly as popular. So, you know, we need to come up with a way to make sure that the naming rights uh, remain with us and that they're forced to call their product what it really is. And let so the you consumer talked sort of So you talked a couple times what? about the importance of a story. Um, and so how, how local does that story have to be? I mean, is regional local enough? Is within the state local enough? Or, or how local does that really need to be? Or not at so all? It depends on the customer. So in Houston, the, the highest profile restaurant in Houston, they quite literally get their pigs delivered to them in a plastic bag. I think that's a little too local for my comfort as a meat purveyor. Um, so you've got people that want to buy product that was alive that morning and killed on the farm that afternoon and then on the plate tonight. I think that's a bit much. That's just me, but I'm also very pro inspection. So for a lot of customers, the, the word local by USDA definition has to be, I think, within 400 miles. That's a pretty wide path from a, a, a labeling standpoint, of what you can put on a menu. So state has a big deal. You know, if you're in Texas and you can stamp Texas on the side of it, it's gonna fly off the shelves. We're talking about Oklahoma beef in Oklahoma. So I think on a state level, especially in your metropolitan areas, uh, that, that state thing will resonate. Um, but you know, when it comes to beef marketing, it really comes down, like I said, to the cowboy with a mustache on a horse. That's what unfortunately resonates most with consumers that, you know, if you're in a pasture with black cows on a horse and you're selling Midwestern beef to a guy in Florida, he's going to resonate with that rancher story more than he's going to resonate with uh, its geography. Super. So next question. So do you see differences in prices from the big four versus regional plants because of their efficiencies? Uh, and can smaller plants compete without an added storyline behind their price? Um, so what I, yes and no to that question. So it varies by regional plant. So there's some regional plants that do custom kill for people that we sell some of that product through the food service channels. And what I see mostly is real discrepancy in packaging and sometimes in quality of craftsmanship. That's really kind of where, where I see the most difference. Um, and a lot of those smaller custom plants um, are, are, sell, are processing like Wagyu or something like that. So yes, there's a price difference there. But for the most part, if it's just fed cattle going through a plant, no, I don't see that much of a price difference. Um, it, it's going to come down to, to what kind of, if it's fed beef or cow kill, uh, that's a lot of it. Um, and then transportation is going to be the, the next, is going to be the first big uh, difference in terms of price. Can I get beef out of Denver as easy as I can get beef out of Omaha or Pennsylvania or, or wherever that may be? Freight is a huge component conversation. So I have one more question here and then we'll we will move on to Dawn as our membership gal. So so you mentioned adding value to our product of beef. What has in your opinion has the most opportunity to add value mandatory ID or mandatory cool? Ooh. 
<laughs> neither. Let's be honest. Uh, consumers don't care about mandatory ID. That's something that we would do for ourselves in terms of traceability. Um, that would help us on the export side, to be honest, though. That's mandatory ID would probably be a bigger hit for export customers. Um, we're, we're behind in that area globally. A lot of our ex import partners, they have traceability systems that are, you know, one exists, which is better than we've got into or are really advanced. Um, Mcool is not going to add any value to our product, guys. If anything, it re removes consumer buying power in terms of raising prices for a label that they don't really care about. Um, if you want customers to buy on origin, set up a branded beef program. In the marketplace, there's 30 some odd branded beef programs that sell in the food service and not one of them have an origin claim. And I have to think that the marketers at CAB who have invented this whole scheme, um, if they thought that origin was really important, they'd slap origin on the side of it. You know, they really led the charge in natural and antibiotic free and some of those things early on, uh, you know, they, they were setting some of those precedents back 10 years ago when others hadn't even thought of it yet. I promise that if beef marketers had thought origin was really the next home run to add, you know, two or four more percent to something, we'd have done it by now. It, there's just no value there. Thank you. And so I want to thank you again for joining us tonight. And for those of you who maybe missed the beginning, you know, based on feedback from you guys over the past four weeks, uh, we have planned to add another webinar focused on risk mitigation for both the cow-calf side and the feeder side. Uh, and that'll be on Tuesday, June 2nd at 7 p.m. And we're excited to welcome the folks from the Kentucky Cattlemen as a partner in that webinar. And so uh, after this is over, you'll be seeing more information about that uh, in your email. And so now uh, we welcome Don Caldwell, who is um, Nebraska Cattlemen's uh, Chair of Membership. So welcome, Don. All right. Thanks, Ashley. Kay, thank you so much. This was, it was super enlightening. And I just think back through our four webinars, we started out with live cattle marketing the challenges that we've, we've, we've been having and experiencing, the trends that have happened through the, through the years, especially since the drought years ago, and now we end up with what does it mean to actually get it on somebody's plate. So what a great series we've had. For all of you that have been watching, thank you very much, and I urge you to consider membership if, um, if you are not. It, it does, in fact, um, require staff and time and investment to be able to do things like this for you as as producers, and we want uh, we want you to be involved in your industry and have a say so. So please, if you're not a Nebraska Cattlemen member, consider it. Uh, call and ask questions. We welcome them, and definitely we welcome you back on June 2nd for our next webinar um, for risk management training. So Kate, thank you very much. Everyone, thank you for joining, and have a great rest of the evening. Good night.